Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're just going to give people a couple minutes to, to filter in and we'll get started. Hi, everybody. We're just going to give people one more minute to uh, filter in and then we will get started. Okay, welcome everybody uh, to today's uh, webinar about Watched at Work, uh, a survey of Canada's public sector workers uh, working from home. Uh, my name is Sam Andrew, I'm the Managing Director of the Dais, uh, and this is my colleague Joe Masudi, a Senior Policy Analyst, um, and we uh, together uh, are at a newly created uh, institute at Toronto Metropolitan University, uh, which is a Public Policy and Leadership Institute, and the result of the merger between uh, the Brookfield Institute and the Leadership Lab. And uh, we're pleased to uh, be with your, you today and share some uh, recent research uh, that we've conducted about uh, remote work. Uh, uh, this is the result of a study uh, that we've done uh, with our co-authors, uh, Michael Gregg, uh, Patrick Newman, and Corey Searcy uh, from PMU, um, and funded by uh, the Future Skills Center. Uh, and thanks very much to IPAC for putting, uh, for putting this on. We um, conducted this study uh, last year, and um, uh, you know the COVID nineteen pandemic obviously has fundamentally changed uh, the way that we work in Canada. Still, uh, nearly half of uh, Canadian workers are regularly working from home, um, and so we wanted to understand how uh, the pandemic has has changed work and uh, its implications, uh, both you know on the positive side and, and the negative side, uh, and um, we decided to do this study to try to get an up-to-date understanding about how employers were supporting employees working from home on their performance supports, uh, as well as how their work was being monitored from, from home. Um, we believe this study is, is the first of its kind um, uh, to, to ask these questions, and uh, we're excited to, to walk through um, the results um, today. So uh, Joe is gonna throw in the chat uh, the slides that we're gonna be um, uh, uh, using and uh, which you can follow along uh, and I'm also gonna start uh, sharing my screen. There we go. Um, so this is based on an online survey uh, that was done with 2000 people uh, working from home in Canada uh, uh, in October of 2022, uh, both in English and French. Uh, uh, 1500 of these uh, people were employees, 500 were supervisors, and we compare and contrast the attitudes uh, and experiences of those two, two groups as well. Of this total 2,000, uh, about 25%, 475, worked for a public or a government employer. So today's um, presentation really focuses in on this group um, of public workers um, and uh, shows how it compares to the private and, and, and nonprofit um, uh, sectors as well. Um, and um, um, uh, the study as a whole is coming out uh, in the coming month um, for you know the, the population as a whole, but for, for IPAC, we decided to just kind of center in on um, on public workers. So the first uh, finding um, maybe won't come as a surprise. Uh, people who are re working remotely really like it. Um, uh, we asked people how satisfied they were with their job uh, working remotely. Uh, you can see 46% said uh, very high. 30% uh, uh, said uh, somewhat high for a total of, of 76%. Uh, this compares uh, pretty um, pretty much exactly the same as the uh, population, working population overall. Um, and then when we asked people um, uh, what their job satisfaction was working on site um, at, at their employer's workplace, you can see um, uh, satisfaction uh, it dropped off uh, considerably almost by about half uh, to 39% uh, total. Again, the public sector doesn't uh, differ very much from the overall uh, uh, um, employment sector, um, but you can see that employees um, are liking uh, working remotely more than supervisors, 77% um, satisfaction for the employees and 68% uh, for the supervisors. 
We also asked people, um, you know, what the impacts were of uh, remote work since they uh, since the pan start of the pandemic. Um, and so we asked people, has your work life balance uh, uh, improved uh, since since the start of the pandemic? You can see 69% of public sector workers uh, said that it has, compared to only 10% who who said it's been reduced. Um, and in fact, the public sector um, uh, employees a higher percentage. Um, uh, statistically significantly higher percentage um, said that um, their work-life balance has increased. Um, uh, supervisors um, also, on balance, think that their work-life balance has improved um, since the pandemic, um, it, uh, but slightly less than, than employees at 57%. Um, we also asked um, how much uh, remote work has impacted the amount of work that they get done. So this is a self-perception, but um, you can see 57% of employees uh, think that the amount of work that they've gotten done has increased as a result of remote work. Only 9% think it's gotten worse. Um, supervisors have somewhat um, more pessimistic uh, views, but um, only slightly. Still, again, on balance, uh, a majority um, uh, think that the amount of work that their employees get done has increased as a result of remote work, and a minority think it's gotten worse. Um, we asked people uh, if the support they were receiving from their supervisor uh, has uh, changed as a result of uh, remote work and uh, since the start of the pandemic. The majority think it hasn't changed very much. The 50 percent, um, the majority think it's um, uh, it had, it's had no impact um, uh, on balance. Uh, some people think it's uh, a, a larger proportion think it's gotten better, but uh, not a huge difference. Um, supervisors have a, um, uh, a greater proportion think uh, that it's uh, impacted their ability uh, negatively, um, but also a larger proportion think it's gotten better in terms of the amount of support. So um, kind of a mixed bag on, on in terms of perceptions around how uh, employees get support working remotely. Um, and then finally, probably not surprisingly, people uh, do think that the, their connection with their colleagues has been impacted negatively. Um, uh, you can see uh, uh, nearly uh, a majority think that the connect their connections with their colleagues um, uh, has gotten has been reduced as re as a result of remote work, um, and so you know in particular that last part about connections with their colleagues and, and collaboration I think is at the heart of a lot of the discourse and um, uh, concern uh, uh, driving bringing uh, employees uh, back to work um, um, in person. We then asked people how often they're expected to go in uh, to the office um, uh, or in-person uh, work. Um, I do want to note this was done in October of, of 2022, and so uh, you know quite a bit uh, may have uh, evolved since then. Um, but you can see here that the public sector um, uh, had, on balance, a greater proportion of um, in-person work expectation than the not-for-profit and the for-profit sector. Um, uh, Seventeen percent of the public sector workers said they had no fixed expectation; it's up to them when to go in. Uh, Twenty-two percent said they were fully remote, um, but then a majority had some expectation of going in in person uh, between, you know, once, twice, uh, uh, three, and four four days a week. Um, uh, and um, uh, you can see that kind of the total of the blue bars um, is is greater in the public sector than in the for-profit sector. Um, um, and again, uh, you can see that supervisors have a greater expectation of going in in person. Again, kind of the total of the blue bars is, is quite a bit higher for supervisors uh, compared uh, uh, to employees. Uh, in general, um, women uh, had higher rates of, of working from home and, and flexible work arrangements uh, than men. Um, but uh, this was a weaker relationship in the public sector where um, uh, um, it was more even between the genders. Um, uh, so uh, on balance, the public sector uh, has shifted to more in-person work um, uh, than for-profit. And then we asked people, uh, um, or we compared uh, the relationship of how often they were going in uh, versus uh, the quality kind of metrics that we, we looked at earlier. So uh, you can see here on-site attendance uh, in the week prior to the survey, the people who went in not at all 
were fully remote, um, which is about 38%, had a higher job uh, satisfaction working remotely, um, and were much more likely to say that they have low job satisfaction uh, working on site. So there's a group that, you know, really prefers to be at home and, and likes to be at home uh, and does not want to be on site. Um, and, and the blue is statistically significantly higher and the red is statistically significantly lower than the average and uh, black is, is about the average. Um, uh, so you can see that that group that um, uh, works fully from home, um, they uh, have a higher level of trust in their employer um, on average. Um, and about the same level of uh, saying that they have a reduced connection with their colleagues and about an average amount of, of work um, uh, is getting done, uh, uh, which I found interesting. Once you get up to um, two and three or more days, you can see that their satisfaction working remotely is less. They're more likely to say, especially at three or more days, uh, that um, their satisfaction working on site is higher. Um, and so, uh, but then um, you can see that that group that is requ being required to go in um, or is going in two or three days have a slightly lower trust in their employer. Um, on the flip side, though, at three or more days, people are less likely to say that their connection with their colleagues has been reduced. Again, maybe not surprisingly. So I think it you know speaks to a bit of a divide in the employees as a group that really would prefer to be at home and are. Um, saying that that impacts their trust strongly. Um, and there's a group that uh, doesn't mind going in as much. Their satisfaction working um, on site uh, is not as different uh, between on site and remote. Um, and that group uh, says they have better connections with their colleagues. So, you know, uh, this probably, again, doesn't um, come as a huge surprise, but um, it's it, I think it's important to point out that it's kind of not a monolithic experience. Uh, there's people. Um, with different attitudes uh, among the public sector. Um, we then asked people how much support they were getting and what types of support they were getting uh, from uh, their employers and their supervisors. So uh, we asked people, um, do you have regular one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with your supervisor? 41% um, of public sector employees said that they did, just uh, slightly less than the overall population. 68% said they had regular team meetings, which is, uh, again, slightly higher than um, the overall population. Um, but together, 75% are regularly meeting either with their supervisor or their team. Um, we then asked people, were you getting ongoing feedback on your work uh, from your supervisor? About one third said that they do. Uh, and another 12% said that um, they were getting feedback from a mentor that's not their supervisor. So in total, about 38% say they're uh, receiving ongoing feedback, and those proportions aren't significantly different from, uh, from the population as a whole. And then about half, 46%, say they're getting an annual or regular performance review. Only 7% said they were getting none of these things. So most public sector workers um, are, are receiving some sort of uh, performance support. Um, we then, again, uh, correlated that uh, assessment, uh, sorry, the performance supports with um, those quality metrics, or sorry, with an assessment of how uh, helpful, adequate, distracting, or intrusive uh, those um, uh, approaches were. Uh, so we asked people, you know, are the performance supports you're receiving, are they helpful? Um, are they adequate? Are they distracting? Are they intrusive? So um, people who are receiving um, uh, meetings, regular meetings, and regular feedback, which is 31% of, of uh, uh, public sector workers um, have the highest uh, rating of helpfulness and adequateness. So 88% uh, said the performance supports they're receiving are helpful. 84% uh, said uh, they're adequate. Only a quarter think that the, uh, the performance supports the meetings and the feedback are distracting or intrusive. So the combo of those things produces the highest um, ratings. People who receive meetings only, so no feed, no ongoing feedback, um, which is about half of, of public sector workers, um, have more average uh, ratings, about 74% say helpful, 72% say adequate. Um, the people who aren't receiving regular meetings, uh, but just get regular feedback, um, have uh, somewhat lower ratings of, of helpfulness. 
And then there's 15% of people who say they're seeing none of those things, uh, neither of those things. Um, and they're the most likely to say um, that they have the lowest uh, rating of, of helpfulness and adequateness. So basically summary, uh, regular meetings and regular feedback uh, uh, employees uh, give the highest ratings. We asked people what uh, level of control they believed that they had over uh, their performance supports. Uh, we prompted them with examples of the timing of meetings or the ability to request feedback. 28% um, said they have a lot of control. 57% uh, said they have some control. Uh, only 10% said they have no control over the performance supports they receive, which is pretty good. Um, people who said uh, they have um, control are more likely uh, to be satisfied. Um, and have higher trust in their employer. Um, so, um, you know, ideally we'd have maybe more uh, uh, sense of control, but overall I thought this was pretty good. And now we're gonna turn it over to Joe, who's gonna talk more about uh, the monitoring side. Great, thank you, Sam. Uh, yes, so this half of the presentation will focus mostly on, well, will focus on the remote side of, of, uh, of the survey that we had conducted. Uh, and so, uh, so we were interested in learning uh, about what types of devices um, uh, were issued to, uh, to employees, whether they were using their personal devices uh, to conduct work uh, working remotely, or whether these devices were um, provided by their employers. Uh, and so a large majority of, of, of our respondents indicated that the devices that were provided were from, uh, uh, from their employers at 77%. Uh, and only 18% had indicated that they were using their own personal devices. Um, the, the implications here are that uh, uh, typically uh, when it comes to using employer-issued devices uh, with respect to um, um, uh, surveillance technologies or, or monitoring electronically monitoring uh, workers, uh, there's a lot more leniency when it comes to installing those types of technologies on employer issued devices. We could also see here that um, that there's relatively uh, uh, the 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 figures that we see here uh, with uh, uh, that focuses on the public sector are relatively comparable to the other sectors as well. So for instance, 74% um, um, is, uh, is what we uh, retrieved from, from all other sectors in comparison to the, uh, the public sector. So we were also interested in looking at uh, more more specifically. We we're interested in looking at uh, the 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 mo the the. the the type of monitoring that takes place uh, or that um, employees experience working from home, the electronic monitoring that's taking place. And so uh, what we see here in this in this slide is that 38% of our respondents indicated that they experience some sort of electronic monitoring. Um, and uh, we, we further categorize that uh, into these two um, uh, typologies. Uh, the first is loosely monitored. Um, and so this is the type of monitoring that, for instance, um, an employee may log in uh, and report that they've logged in with their supervisor uh, so that it's hours logged or they check in with their supervisor and, and let them know that, hey, I, I'm online now. So it's it's we, we uh, constructed this as being loosely monitored. Uh, and then uh, the second category is the actively monitored through technology. So these are the types of technologies that are, um, you can think of, for instance, keyboard logging or uh, desktop um, uh, capturing of your activities. Uh, you can think of um, network uh, or checking in on emails, um, uh, whether that's inbox or outbox. Um, those are the types of active screening of of uh, of, uh, of uh, employee activities that we were uh, focused on. So at that level, we're looking at 11%. Oh, and, and again, I guess I should note here that uh, the numbers, again, that you see with respect to um, the, the public sector, for instance, are, again, comparable to other sectors as well. Uh, so in the in the private sector, not-for-profit, for instance, we can see um, the numbers are relatively the same. So 27% are loosely monitored. That's that's roughly comparable to the 23% that's that's in all other sectors. We were also interested in looking uh, more specifically at the types of um, 
digital monitoring tools um, that uh, that uh, employees um, had uh, had experienced uh, or were subjected to. Uh, so we provided a list of options to respondents, uh, and uh, this this particular slide indicates um, um, uh, the most uh, popular answers, uh, with email and inbox monitoring being. Um, uh, the top ranked at 28%, uh, and followed by chats uh, and messages, um, websites visited, phone calls, and then it kind of trickles down with the more intrusive forms of electronic monitoring. So we can see um, location-based monitoring, webcam video, um, capturing um, uh, cap uh, computer screen captures, or keyboard keystrokes, social media, biometrics. They just kind of start trickling down. Uh, but nonetheless, they do take place. I think uh, it's uh, important to note. Um, and another uh, another interesting finding here is we can see that there that what's being experienced by public um, uh, employees within the the public sector, again, are relatively comparable to other sectors as well. It's I mean, it's not to say that, for instance, that uh, employees or workers within uh, the public sector are more um, surveilled or electronically monitored compared to the other sectors. Um, and uh, another thing to note here is that 69% um, have some element of their work monitored. Um, so of the 11% that we saw in the previous slide, 69% um, um, say that there's, there's some electronic monitoring that's taking place uh, and that and by that we mean not just stored but actively screened or reviewed uh so uh we were also interested in looking at um the effects of uh electronic monitoring um in particular to these uh, three variables here so on job satisfaction on employer trust and on uh levels of stress uh, and so we looked at uh, we we looked specifically at individuals who we categorize as being intensely monitored. So these are respondents who had identified that they were either subjected to location, webcam, keystroke, screen, or biometrics. And we wanted to look specifically at their levels of job satisfaction um, and um, and their trust in their employer, as well as their levels of stress. And so, it turns out here that um, there is a relationship here that job satisfaction does decrease um, when those levels of intense forms of monitoring are taking place and employees are subjected to. Uh, we also noticed that um, uh, that their levels of trust actually fall down. So um, it's at 64% compared to those other groups that are not intensely monitored at 75%. And also their levels of stress increase. So um, and again, this is these are uh, participants or sorry, respondents that um, have identified um, being um, intensely monitored through either of those categories that you see at the bottom here. Um, and this coincides with um, the, the literature within uh, the research rather um, that describes this uh, relationship between excessive forms of surveillance or electronic monitoring and the negative psychosocial implications. Um, including um, affecting negatively affecting um, levels of stress and trust and um, and satisfaction. We were also interested in looking at the um, the purpose of uh, of remote work monitoring. So we asked respondents what they believed the purpose of uh, the electronic monitoring that they were subjected to was. Uh, and, and we asked the same question to both employees and supervisors. And uh, so what I'd like folks to bring their attention to in this particular slide is the difference between supervisors and employees, uh, particularly on the last two categories here. Uh, so we asked, so employees, 33% of employees um, said that the uh, electronic monitoring that they had um, that was in place was to manage their workload workload or to track the the task completion uh whereas uh 45 percent of supervisors uh, uh claimed that was the case so a bit of a difference between 
uh, what employees are saying on the one hand and what supervisors are saying on the other. Uh, again, we noticed uh, a bit of a difference in this last category here, where employees suggested that um, the electronic monitoring in place was to improve or understand organizational productivity. And supervisors, on the other hand, said 39% uh, of which uh, 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 suggested that that was the case, uh, comparing that to 32% of the employees. So a bit of a discrepancy between what supervisors are saying and what the employees are saying. We were interested in looking at the amount of control that, um, that employees or workers had uh, when it comes to the types of technologies or electronic monitoring technologies that they had, um, that they were subject to or experienced at work. Um, and by control, we really mean like whether employees were able to turn on or off the electronic surveillance or monitoring, uh, whether they were able to contest any decisions if, there, if that form of monitoring uh, produced decisions, for instance. And, um, and this level of control, again, uh, there's a bit of a difference between, um, um, or, or sorry, uh, so, so supervisors happen to have, not surprisingly, more control over, over that type of functionality of the electronic monitoring that takes place, whereas employees don't. Um, so 51% of employees say they have at least some control or a lot of control of, of, uh, um, of the electronic monitoring, whereas on the, on the flip side, 80% of supervisors uh, suggest that they do. Another interesting finding about this is the large, uh, rather large number of, of employees uh, suggesting that they have no control over, uh, over the electronic monitoring at 39%. Uh, on, so we were, uh, so a, a little context with this particular slide here. Um, when we were, when we introduced this survey, um, Bill, 8, Bill 88, which is um, 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 uh, a bill that was introduced in, in the province of Ontario to um, require employers uh, with 25 employees or more to provide um, um, uh, a, a written policy to, to, uh, to their employees on uh, the type of electronic monitoring that they may be subjected to. And so we were interested in learning more about whether um, employees did, in fact, receive information provided about their about the electronic monitoring. And uh, and uh, what's interesting here is that um, um, sixty six percent of employees say that they have been provided information, uh, and uh, we can compare that to what supervisors are, are, are suggesting, which is at 85%. So again, a bit of a discrepancy between what, what, um, what supervisors are saying and what employees are, are saying. Um, if we were to further look more closely into, um, into the, the, the figure, uh, the 66% figure in, with employees, we can see that only 30% were provided complete information in writing. Um, we also, uh, which is which is what the law stipulates that it should be, um, that information should be in complete writing. Um, so the little to some information, which is verbal, doesn't qualify. Um, and uh, and so we also looked at um, this case uh, or that figure in Ontario, and we noticed that uh, it was about the same thing. It was about around thirty percent. Um, uh, claimed that they were, or suggested that they pro were provided complete information uh, about the electronic monitoring that they experienced at work in writing. Um, and just a note here as well is that um, those uh, respondents that were provided uh, complete information will, uh, uh, were much more, uh, had higher levels, uh, significant higher levels of, of, of trust in their employer. So there's that relationship between transparency and employer trust. So in summary, uh, what was this about? <laughs> well, uh, it's the first of its kind uh, uh, in Canada since the pandemic. It's a representative survey that explores the attitudes and experiences of remote workers. Uh, and in particular, it, it, it explores the performance supports, which Sam had covered uh, in the first half. 
and the monitoring component, which I had covered in the latter half. Um, what we see here is that 39% of public sectors uh, of public sector workers, they either had no fixed requirement uh, to work on site or were fully remote, which is a lower proportion compared to the private sector at 48%. Um, we also uh, learned that uh, a vast majority of remote workers were satisfied and that um, uh, working remotely at 76% uh, compared to being on site. So they like working remotely. Uh, again, no surprise there. Uh, we also found that, um, uh, that more than half of employees um, said that they get more work done um, working remotely. So, uh, which is a, a which is also consistent between um, employees and supervisors, and a figure that's pretty consistent between the two. Um, so, it, so uh, questions of productivity, um, uh, which we often hear about, were um, uh, are countered here uh, ac according to this figure. Um, we also found that. Um, that, that with remote work, there's a there's a decline in connections with with colleagues, which again is um, uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting finding, and uh, it's a, it's a it's a particular tension that uh, managers need to uh, reconcile with uh, with uh, with employees. Um, and seventy five percent of public sector workers have regular team or supervisor meetings, uh, and um, and 38% uh, receive ongoing feedback from a supervisor or mentor. 69% uh, of public sector remote workers have some element of work um, digitally monitored. That's that's the actively uh, form of, of monitoring that we uh, saw in the previous slide. Um, and the that 32% uh, experience digital monitoring of that more intrusive kind that we talked about, which was location, keyboard, webcam, computer screen, or biometrics. Um, and that group reported lower levels of satisfaction, trust in their employers, and higher levels of, uh, of, of stress. Um, and finally, um, uh, we learned that only 30% of employees said that they've they've been provided with complete information about the electronic monitoring that's taking place at their places of work. Um, but those that did uh, were provided um, um, uh, with written policies um, uh, ranked a lot higher in terms of um, um, levels of of higher levels of trust with their employer. And uh, yeah, I'll pass it back to you, Sam. Thanks, Joe, uh, and thanks everybody for listening. We hope uh, that was interesting. Uh, that's the end of, of our presentation, uh, but we are happy to take questions from you using uh, the Q&A function in, uh, in the um, uh, bottom of your screen. And we already have one, and we'll go uh, there, um, which is um, uh, how much of this research uh, do you believe would be skewed based off of um, the loudest of society promoting that work from home is best? When much more advanced countries have already proven it's not. Um, uh, I think it's an interesting question. I think part of why we did this study in the first place was um, to create some representative data about that very question, understand both um, the perspectives of uh, employees and supervisors. Um, uh, you know, these are contentious questions. It also relates a lot to the type of work you're doing. Um, you know, I think the the, there is a real perception that it has impact um, productivity, but I think when you pick away at that, sometimes it's more about um, you know group work or collaboration or strategic planning type of work that is hard to do uh, when you're uh, distributed at 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 home as compared to say written work or or other um, uh, work that's done more kind of individually or, or independently, um, and so you know part of why we we ask. Uh, these questions and, and did this study was to, um, you know, uh, gauge that. I think people experienced remote work for years during the pandemic, and it's been a kind of a, a sea change um, in uh, both people's uh, ability to experience it and, um, um, uh, you know, employers were required to build up the infrastructure, the technical infrastructure, and otherwise um, uh, to make it happen. And so um, I think it's still an open question whether it's uh, genuinely uh, the best approach to work. Um, so uh, I think that would be my answer to that question. Joe, do you want to add anything? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, there obviously there's. I mean, I think I think with every any research study, there are its limitations uh, as well. But uh, I mean, we are, we also have to note here that like our uh, our sample population was focused on those who worked remotely, and so we we're looking specifically at those uh, particular individuals. Um, and uh, and so um, you know, I, I think what was uh, quite surprising to me was uh, the question of productivity. Um, and how that was very comparable to um, uh, between um, supervisors and um, and, uh, and and workers and, and, and individual employees uh, in the sense that they didn't find that like productivity really um, 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 had declined. Um, so, uh, but with that said, uh, there are also it's not it's not as though it, this is uh, um, um, I guess. There are different there are different types of of of, of uh, works uh, in, in professions that uh, remote work may not you know it just may not work uh, work out so um, yeah and maybe one last caveat is this entire study was done with people who are working from home so we obviously have filtered out the people you know completely working on site who may you know prefer that that mode of working so overall caveat um maybe we'll um take the next one which is um i have uh, personally experienced stronger connections with colleagues across the organization and geography using online platforms yeah uh, i think a lot of uh, folks would feel the same and within my team there's more focus on having a regular team meeting than there was before the pandemic did you ask that question as well whether people experienced improved connections so yeah we asked people whether they felt that it had improved um, or gotten worse and so on balance more people said it had gotten worse. So 45% of employees uh, said worse and 22% said better. So, you know, you're obviously with 22% who, who think that it has uh, uh, gotten better and about a third say, say no impact at all. But, you know, I do think it's worth pointing out at least on balance, about a majority think it's gotten worse. And so, you know, uh, uh, it probably depends on the nature of your team, your supervisor, of course, the type of organization you work for, but, um, you are not alone, I guess, in that experience. And we did try to probe at that. Um, Joe, you want to add anything to that? Uh, I don't, no, I don't think so, no. Um, we also have a question. What are the plans uh, to continue this uh, research as hybrid continues to evolve? We would love to. This was sort of one-time uh, support that we received uh, from the Future Skill Center, which we're appreciative uh, of. But yeah, it, uh, as we sort of said, this was a, First look in a post-pandemic context, but it was also in October of last year. You know, I think if we did it, you know, next October, uh, attitudes, as you say, will have continued to evolve. And certainly, I think the proportion of people um, uh, working um, remotely um, continues to change across industries. And so, um, yeah, some longitudinal uh, look at this, I think, would be would be excellent. But um, we don't at the moment have specific uh, plans. Um, all right. Um, we have another question. Did you notice a generational divide in the responses? Um, it's a good question. Um, in general, uh, uh, somewhat um, older uh, uh, people um, are were more likely to say that they were working, um, or older workers were more likely to say that they were working at home. Um, uh, and uh, preferred it more than than younger workers on balance, but um, um, not massive differences. But um, uh, but there were differences. Um, um, younger workers were also more likely uh, to say that their work was uh, digitally monitored, um, which uh, we sort of queried was that the nature of the work or um, younger people's maybe digital savviness in being able to notice um, um, uh, the monitoring, uh, but uh, that was another difference that we noticed by age. Um, oh, and actually, and rates of uh, feedback from a supervisor or mentor were much higher among younger people, which probably is you know, a surprise based on even a stage of career, uh, but it was, I think, encouraging to see that younger people were much more likely to say that they received feedback from a supervisor or a mentor. Um, I think those are the things that stood out to me by age. Joe, did you, did you yeah. recall anything else? 
And I, I think that's the, yeah, I think that um, adequately summarizes the, the, um, the, the differences we found in, in terms of um, that generational divide. Uh, but like going back more uh, in, to that to that uh, question um, is uh, I think it's it's also a part of uh, uh, younger uh, folks uh, probably requiring a little bit more or uh, the need for more feedback from from a supervisor or a mentor, uh, considering that it's it's perhaps um, uh, uh, if perhaps their first job or, 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 um, or, uh, they're making their way towards, uh, um, um, uh, they're making way there. So there's, there, um, sorry, I was a little distracted by the, the lawnmower in the back, in the back over here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think it makes sense that, that, uh, that younger people were, would, would be particularly more interested in receiving that type of feedback, um, given their circumstances and entering the, the, the job market. I meant to say too that Joe and I are doing this both from home as, to be inspired by the subject of our work. Um, uh, we'll go to maybe the next question. Uh, I work for a public organization in Ontario and have not received notification of surveillance technologies used. Based on the survey, do you believe that the public sector in Ontario is following the new law? I think it's a really interesting question. Joe, you probably want to jump in on this. We work for Toronto Metropolitan University. We did receive an email um, um, a few months back. Uh, was clearly prompted by uh, this new law of a new of a new policy, but it was you know maybe in classic form of these well intended policies then implemented by uh, lawyers. Uh, it was like so high level that basically like anything could be monitored at any time. Thank you. It was essentially what the uh, long policy said, and so um, I do think that uh, um, at least so that that's the experience that I at least have in Ontario, uh, where I think the Kind of spirit of the law um, didn't get you know sort of uh, implemented. Um, I can't speak obviously to, to the organization that you you are working for, but um, uh, I think um, I would be surprised if compliance is very high. If you know, also a, a brand new law just took effect in uh, October, uh, I believe. Um, uh, hopefully, it improves over time as you know the labor inspectors get out there and, and on it and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, we were pleased, we advocated for this change uh, to happen uh, around transparency, because I think transparency is a key kind of policy response. I don't know that there could be a outright ban on workplace monitoring. Obviously, there's valid purposes at times um, for, for, the, for these technologies, um, depending on the nature of the work. But transparency goes a long way in, you know, giving the employees agency to challenge um, uh, what's happening. And so, you know, we're happy that this has um, happened and hope to um, uh, see it operationalized for sure. I don't know if Joe, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess, I guess this the particular uh, uh, person was captured by, you know, the, by, uh, by the very um, low figure of, of uh, individuals who actually did receive or, um, well, I did not receive like complete writing uh, of of the electronic monitoring that's that they're subjected to um, in in writing, um, which um, you know I, I think it, there's also I mean um, I, I think it also raises questions of like uh, of recourse, which uh, which the bill was also criticized for by by, by some researchers, um, saying that um, you know well what happens when uh, when when uh, folks don't receive a uh, a written uh, policy. Um, uh, and and uh, outlining the different types of te technologies that are in use. Um, um, but going back to Sam's point as well, like even when that written policy is introduced, um, as as we had uh, received from TMU, there are just kind of like very very broad types of um, technologies that were really kind of not surprising uh, as well. Um, but um, but yeah, I, I I think it's it's a it's a good first step. Um, unfortunately. Um, um, some organizations um, um, haven't uh, ha haven't um, um, you know uh, committed to to uh, fulfilling the, the, those obligations. Um, so, um, but there are are, are steps to um, to uh, to file a complaint um, with uh, uh, with the ministry. So, yeah. Um, I will keep uh, rolling with the questions here. Uh, so um, maybe just because we're talking about the new law, we'll, we'll answer that one next, which is, 
I work for a federal government department remotely from Western Canada. Are you aware of any steps that the federal public service is taking to inform employees of monitoring our federally regulated workers in Ontario covered by this legislation? I think the answer is no to the first part. It's, it's just provincially regulated uh, work that is, is regulated by this legislation. Um, I don't think we are. Um, MP Michael Cocho has um, been working on a private member's bill uh, that would essentially require this of, of federally regulated uh, work, um, uh, I think in part inspired by the Ontario bill, uh, but it hasn't, um, I don't think it's been introduced or, or, or moved forward, um, uh, but um, it's a good question. Um, and then um, uh, what part of this research do you think will have a significant shift uh, if it is done again after a year of people going uh, back into their physical work locations? I mean, I would just be speculating. I imagine if we did this again, the proportion of uh, people required to go in um, on a fixed schedule or, or, you know, kind of more than uh, one or two days a week will have increased. Um, I, I would be curious about how rates of satisfaction, perceptions around amount of work done, perceptions about connections with their colleagues will have evolved in a more hybrid context. Um, uh, this was, you know, in, uh, back in October, I think just the beginning of a, of a return to work for, for many employers. Um, and then again, would uh, basically practices around supporting or monitoring of employers have evolved um, further as, you know, technology has evolved? Um, I think these are kind of open questions, but I think certainly the mix of uh, work and, and a further uh, move back to in-person would, would be picked up. I don't know, Joe, do you have yeah, no, I agree with with all those things that uh, um, that you pointed out to. Uh, yeah, I'd be particularly interested in in, in knowing if there's been any changes to uh, perhaps even um, um, uh, transparency disclosures of electronic monitoring, uh, maybe differences in the types of electronic monitoring technologies, whether whether new ones are increasingly being used or not. I, we've got a few um, you know pr proposed um, uh, uh, pieces of legislation that are in the pipe line right now, if they ever do come to pass, um, and whether that they will have an impact on, um, you know, these types of uh, uh, practices that are taking place in, in our workplaces. So yeah, totally worth uh, following up on. Um, uh, but uh, and, and, and definitely interested to, to find out um, the, the differences. I think it's important to conduct these type of longitudinal type of studies to figure out, you know, um, patterns and trends and, uh, and they're very helpful for, for policy making. Um, our next question, did you query length of employee and supervisor participation in the workforce? Uh, some people may be returning to work later in life, but had time away from paid work. Um, we didn't. We asked about time with their specific employer. So we were basically querying whether uh, more recent hires uh, were more likely to be supported or monitored in, in different ways um, and didn't find anything particularly different other than what you'd expect what we Step previously by age in this group, younger and newer workers um, receiving more, more feedback. Um, but we didn't specifically ask what you're asking, which is length in the workforce. Um, we just asked about age, which I'm acknowledging is, is a different question than, than age. Uh, that is it for our QA, unless um, there's some last ones to come in. But we may wrap early unless there's more. We'll skip this one, one more minute. All right. Well, thanks very much, everyone, uh, for, for tuning in and, and your interest and engagement. Um, uh, thanks again to IPAC for, for organizing uh, this, as well as the Future Skills uh, Center for the support for this project. And again, the help and, and the work of our co-authors, Michael Gregg, Patrick Freeman, and Corey Searcy. Um, uh, we will be releasing uh, the, this report um, uh, likely next month uh, through the Future Skills Center. Um, so uh, look out for that. Uh, we want to give you a kind of a preview of the data now. And um, thanks everybody for your time and hope you have a great uh, rest of your day. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone.